Good evening and welcome to our Monday Thursday worship service, whether you are here in the sanctuary or you are joining us from your home. Tonight we remember the night in which Jesus ate a last meal with his friends, was betrayed, and prayed fervently to his father in the Garden of Gethsemane. Tonight is a solemn time, a time of reflection. Hopefully we are prompted to remember both the times when we have sat together with God and when we have let him down. Tonight we will partake in communion as the disciples did so many years ago. It was the last meal that they ate with their leader, their friend, their savior. That meal was indeed a special one. Not only was it the one during which Jesus instituted the sacrament of Holy Communion for us, but for these law-abiding Jewish believers, it was the Passover meal, a high holy day. They were participating in the ancient tradition of their ancestors, who on that day would remember when God delivered them from their Egyptian masters. Tonight we will partake of grape juice, representing the wine they drank, and the unleavened bread, made without yeast. Hear these words from the book of Exodus, chapter 12, which gives us the reason for why we celebrate the meal tonight. This is a day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. For seven days you are to eat bread made without yeast. Celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread, because it was on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. The dough was without yeast because they had been driven out of Egypt and did not have time to prepare food for themselves. As we listen, partake, and see tonight, may our hearts be open to what God would have us learn, that through Jesus' experiences, our souls may be stirred to accomplish our calling and our faith in life. Please now listen and watch as we use light to show the support that Jesus had, and then later, how quickly it disappeared. I would now invite Brennan and Sean to come forward um, with their acolyte sticks, as they will be the ones who are lighting the disciples' candles on the altar this evening. The candles this evening represent the disciples gathered for the Passover meal. Judas will always be remembered as the one who betrayed Jesus. However, he was an important disciple. Jesus had called him to follow. Bartholomew was sometimes called Nathaniel. When called by one who came from Nazareth, he found it hard to think this could be the Messiah. He became a disciple only reluctantly. Jude, also known as Thaddeus, is only mentioned in the Gospels. Yet Jesus had chosen him, called him, taught him, and loved him. Thomas would fit well in today's world. He took a scientific approach, demanding true proof. We might wonder if he regularly questioned what Jesus taught. Jesus called him to discipleship. Matthew, the former tax collector, was seen as a collaborator with the Roman occupiers. He collected, he collected money from his own people for support of the Roman government. Jesus saw in him something valuable and called him away from the work that, to follow him. James, known as James the Lesser, to distinguish him from the better known disciple of the same name was the son of Elpheus. He too was called to be a disciple.
Philip lived near the Sea of Galilee. He was well acquainted with the area where Jesus did much of his teaching. Jesus called him away from his familiar work to come and follow. Simon, referred to as the Zealot, belonged to a political terrorist group which wanted to overthrow the Roman rule by violence. Jesus called Simon to a better way. Andrew was called by Jesus, and in turn he brought his brother Simon Peter. Later, Andrew found the boy with the loaves and fish when the great crowd of people were hungry. James was another fisherman called away from his nets. Later, he became the well-respected leader of the church in Jerusalem. John, the brother of James, was also a fisherman. When Jesus spoke to these sons of Zebedee, they responded immediately in following him. Peter will always be remembered as the disciple who is quick to speak out. He professed Jesus as the Messiah and was honored by Jesus for the faith on which to build the church. There were also women who followed Jesus and helped in spreading the word. We light a group of candles to represent those women whose faith was shown in their response to the call of Jesus. All of these were called to let their light shine. They spent three years with Jesus, learning from his words and example. They were invited to share the Last Supper we commemorate tonight. We, too, are called to faithful discipleship. And thank you to Brennan and Sean for lighting them for us. And as you are able, if you will please stand and join in our call to worship as Marcia leads us in this responsive act. The one who loves us unconditionally has invited us here. We are guests at the table of Jesus Christ. We come to the spiritual feast in gratitude. We are awed that our Savior has blessed us in this way. Through the broken bread and the cup of blessing, we participate in the new life Christ offers us. At this table, we know cleansing and forgiveness. In this place, we recognize the sacrifice our Savior made for us. If you'll please remain standing if you're able and hear our opening hymn, which is Go to Dark Gethsemane, number 290. <laughs> Watch with him one beat. 
be seated. Hear now our call to confession. As we worship this evening, this special evening of remembrance, we pause to take time in examining our own sin. We know that the call to the cross was not just for Jesus. It was for our sins as well. Only when we choose to admit them to our God can we recognize what Jesus really did for us that night so long ago. So let us enter into a time of both communal and individual introspection, admitting to God our shortcomings and knowing that we are forgiven them completely. If you will please join with me in saying our unison prayer of confession. Lord, we see your example of how you washed your disciples' feet, and we are driven to confession. We are ashamed at how we clamor for attention, at how we push and shove our way forward in this world. We want to be noticed. But you came to serve, to humble yourself, to give yourself away. You came to die that we might have life. We confess, Lord, that we are not worthy of your attention, but we also recognize that you gave us your attention anyway, and we rejoice. Thank you, Lord, for these holy mysteries. Hear us now as we pray to you in silence. Hear now our assurance of forgiveness. God has heard our voices and listened to our prayers. We are welcomed by Jesus Christ to the table where all may eat and drink and find welcome. Embrace this opportunity to love as we have been loved. Lift up the cup of salvation, for we have been freed from our sins to praise God. Hear us now as we pray the prayer that our Savior taught us this evening to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And our sung response tonight will be, Jesus, keep me near the cross, the first and third verses of number 301 in the hymnal. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There, a precious fountain, free to all the healing stream, flows from Calvary's mountain.
And at this time, I'm going to invite um, Brennan and Sean to come forward for just a brief children's message. You can sit on this side. Well, I want to thank you both very much for being willing to be the ones who light the candles on the altar tonight. This is one of my favorite services of the entire year. And oh, and I have to say that Rufus is not here tonight for the children's message because it's past his bedtime already. So that's why he's not here, okay? Um, so do you know what Monday Thursday is all about? It's okay because at your age, I didn't know much about Monday Thursday. Do you know what the word Maundy means? Any clue? Some people think it's the old spelling of Monday, but that wouldn't work very well. To call it Monday Thursday, that doesn't work very well, does it? So no, it actually doesn't mean that. There actually are two ways that we can think of um, Monday, Monday, and now I, you know, I got myself calling, calling it that. Monday, Thursday. It can mean holy, okay? So it can be understood as holy Thursday. But Monday is a way in which the word mondatum has been translated over the years. Do you know what mondatum means? You don't, they haven't been teaching you Latin in school? <laughs> I'm getting the... Um, Mandatum means command, okay? It means command. So it can also be known as Command Thursday. Do you have any thought in terms of what the command would be that Jesus taught us on this day? What's one thing that you think Jesus might have taught us? Have you ever taken communion before? Holy Communion, the bread, the bread and the grape juice. You have. Okay. Well, G if you listen when I say those words, I usually say, and Jesus asked his, told his disciples, do this as often as you can in remembrance of me. So one of the things that we understand about Monday Thursday is that Jesus gave us a command, an order to participate in Holy Communion as often as we can. Because that way, we understand God in a tangible way. Tangible means we can feel it, okay? And usually, we understand God as spirit. God can be all around us. But when we celebrate communion, we have the bread and the grape juice or wine in some traditions that can be touched. And God says that that is part of who he is as well. So it gives us a better understanding or a different understanding of who God is. And God, through Jesus, said, I want you to do this. So Monday, Thursday, remember, means either holy or command Thursday because of the command that Jesus gave to be able to do communion every time we can so that we'll remember him in a better and different way. Sound good? You think you can remember that for next year? <laughs> Their eyes are going. So it's okay. I might remember to ask you next year. So I'll ask your mom to give you a, a pop quiz earlier in the week, okay? Thanks, guys, for coming up. Appreciate it. And now we will be able to have a choral anthem for tonight. We, of course, are not able to have um, the choir with us tonight. But Karen Newby, our choir director, went through some of the old DVDs. And we were able to come up with, I think this is from a couple of years ago, um, a song called Elements of God's Love. I was not here for this. Um, but I understand that it's a beautiful song. So at this time, we are going to hear and see um, the chancel choir from a few years ago singing Elements of God's Love.
if you would stand for the gospel reading. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will never again drink of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And after I'm raised up, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Though all become deserters because of you, I will never desert you. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even though I must die with you, I will never deny you. And so said all the disciples. The The word word of God God for the people people of God. God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I've always said that I don't think I could ever get too big of an ego because as soon as I did, mother would bring me right back down to size. My brother and I were always applauded when we did something well as children, but not excessively so, a parenting style I'm thankful for later in life. I wasn't bad at academics, and Dan was pretty good at sports, but never were either of us going to win a full scholarship to college on our athletic, intellectual, or musical abilities. Our parents never told us that we were the best, nor did they fight the school if they felt we didn't get what we deserved in terms of grades or opportunities. They were proud of us, but we knew our gifts and talents were well within the range of others. Mom knew this best, being a kindergarten teacher, knowing what other kids were capable of. So whenever I do brag that I'm the best at anything, which I know I'm not, all Mom has to do is give me a tilt to the head, and I better get my delusions of grandeur under control. But delusions are not something we should simply dismiss. While we usually think of delusions as being relatively harmless, People are just being stubborn and thinking certain things. They can cause major difficulties. A delusion is defined as a belief that is persistently held despite evidence to the contrary. In other words, a person will say in all confidence that the sky is colored red when everyone else around him sees it as blue and can prove it. Sometimes we brush people's delusions off as being unique, they're just swimming against the stream, or they just want to be contrary. And often they do involve people just being stubborn, but they can be dangerous as well. The United States just experienced another mass shooting this week, and in many of these cases the subject is delusional, believing he's been called to rid the world of something or that he's living in an alternate reality where bullets don't hurt and he won't go to jail for committing what society has deemed a crime. Stalkers often suffer from the same type of mental disorder. They believe a famous person knows or loves them and can't understand why they aren't allowed into their home. And at times that devotion turns deadly for either the stalker or the celebrity. So what does this have to do with Monday Thursday, a day that we normally connect with communion and sadness for what Jesus is about to experience? Well, it's not Jesus who I think might have been delusional, although some people who don't believe in Christ think that he was. In fact, the Pharisees and Sadducees, probably both those groups, thought Jesus was delusional. No, the person who demonstrated some delusional tendencies at the Last Supper was Peter. During this time, this final time, with all his friends together, 
Jesus says that every one of them will desert him. We usually concentrate hard on the betrayal of Judas, and he is the one who turned him in to the authorities. But less than 24 hours later, every one of those friends had deserted him, attempting to save their own skin, leaving Jesus to essentially die alone on the cross. Thankfully, the women were able to be there and supported him from a distance. But even Peter, the often bragging right-hand man, denied knowing him as the evening went on. But I'm getting ahead of myself. At the final meal, Jesus says to the group, you will all become deserters because of me this night. Interestingly, there is nothing stated as to the reaction of these men. When Jesus said that he would be betrayed by one of them, they buzzed with shock about which one will it be. But nothing is stated as to their reply, according to what is just, he's just told him, that they would all desert him. One can imagine it was likely silence. Then good old Peter breaks the tension with his characteristic braggadocio. Though all become deserters because of you, I will never desert you. One can imagine what the rest of the disciples thought about that statement as well. No stated reaction from them, but there may have been some eye rolls and possibly even resentment that Peter would think that everyone else would leave Jesus, but only he would stay loyal. Remember that his own brother, Andrew, is in the room. I know I'd be a little peeved at my brother if he said something like that. Then I imagine Jesus quietly saying, Peter, truly I tell you, this very night, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Boom. He's put right back in place by God. You might even hear some of the others snicker a bit. Peter just got knocked down a peg. But that doesn't deter him in the least. He comes right back with, even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And after this, all the disciples jump on board and say the same thing. History records that every single one of them did deny Jesus within the next 24 hours. The disciples especially Peter, were being delusional. They had no idea what they were talking about, yet made strong claims they couldn't back up. I'm certain they believed exactly what they said, that they would stay loyal to Jesus always. There had been no reason for them to think differently up until that time. They were in the presence of a mini-celebrity and were aware that some weren't appreciating what he was saying, but didn't think he would be dead within a day. There was no reason to think that they would deny him, yet they did. That's why I think it's important for us to realize the potential for good and bad in each of us. We may think we'd never do this or that, but rarely have we been put in some of those situations. And if we were, our reaction might be very different from what we'd imagine we'd do. I remember one time in my year spent being a chaplain intern at the Children's Medical Center outside Dayton, Ohio, that I had to enter a room with a family who had just been given a very difficult diagnosis for their child. Of course, I'd been prepped for situations like this, and I imagined me delivering an excellent speech, so eloquent about how God cared for the girl and he would bring her safely through this difficulty and everyone would just be so impressed with my healing words. And then I walked in the room with parents who were just devastated and the child who didn't understand what was going on and I found I just didn't have any words, let alone blessed ones. I was quickly cut down to size but I did learn something very valuable from that experience, the ministry of presence. That at times, the best thing you can say is nothing at all. Sometimes people just need to know that someone who cares is near. And if you can be a living embodiment of God's presence, there's not much better than that. I think that at times, 
being delusional is simply a matter of not seeing what is truly in front of us. Or it might be a willful desire to think better of ourselves than we really are. I mean, could Peter truly have known how he would react when his own future was on the line with Jesus going to his death? No. He thought he'd probably be the savior of the savior. But he wasn't. Even he ended up saving his own tail instead of Jesus. We know the rest of the story. After Jesus was arrested, Peter at least attempted to see what he could do. He followed during the night and was able to see parts of Jesus' trial. But not only wasn't he threatened with death before he denied Jesus, he wasn't even threatened. Two servant girls come up and say that he was seen in the company of Jesus, followed then by a group of people saying he was one of the disciples. He denies knowing Jesus each time, even though it wasn't a religious or military person who accused him. Then we have the famous cock crow. Whether this was actually a rooster or a, a horn that was blown around dawn, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that when it happens, Peter remembers Jesus saying that he would deny him three times. And he did. At that point, Peter is all alone. Jesus is in custody. Judas is realizing what he's done. The women are helpless to do anything. And the disciples have scattered to the wind. Peter is alone in dealing with his humiliation. He said he would never leave Jesus' side. Less than a day later, he said three times in public that he never knew him. It's hard when our delusions come crashing down and we actually see reality. It's nice to think that we would never, ever have difficulty following through on our claims, but sooner or later, we usually have to prove our worth. And if we're found to be wanting, how difficult it is to claim it. But what a joy can actually come from it as well. When we realize that we are not quite as good as we, or our dog, thinks we are, we can get back to depending on God more than we usually do. Most Americans, including myself, are taught to be independent that if you just work hard enough and put in the time, you can accomplish almost anything. That works for some things, certainly not for all. Although I don't believe God causes bad things to happen to us, I do believe he allows them at times and doesn't always send miracles because we can learn from our mistakes and our accidents to rely more on him. Even as Jesus was being arrested, Peter thought he could save him on his own. He took out his sword and sliced off the ear of a Roman centurion. Jesus quickly replaced it, healed it, and told Peter that kind of action has no place in what he is trying to accomplish. We are truly delusional if we think we can save God or even ourselves. We need help. We need divine help. Let us be willing to lean on that love of the Lord when we need it. Lastly, let us always remember that we are never beyond God's ability to forgive and then be used for his glory. I can't imagine Peter's devastation when the cock crowed. Everything had been fine just a day earlier. Now his best friend and savior was about to be sentenced to death and he himself had been found wanting despite his boastful claims. I imagine he just wanted to crawl off by himself, lick his wounds, and figure out what was next. To his credit, he went back to the rest of the disciples, more out of fear than anything, I imagine. But he did not give up. And when Easter morning came and the women announced that Jesus had risen, he didn't sulk, but ran quickly to see the empty tomb. Deep down, Peter had a faith that never went away, but he needed to know his place in things. He would become a leader of the church and was forgiven by Jesus, but he was not the Messiah. God has a part for each of us to play in this world. We need to find it and be satisfied with it. Some may be called to be famous. 
Some play supporting roles, but every role is important in God's plan. Let us use what we're given to move God's kingdom forward. Ten years ago, I was blessed to attend a church program by Chuck Colson about a year before he died. If you don't remember who he was, Colson was an attorney who served as special counsel to President Richard Nixon. He was known as Nixon's hitman in that he would do whatever it took to get something done for the president. Unfortunately, that included being involved in the Watergate scandal. Eventually, Colson pled guilty to obstruction of justice and served time in jail. Just before that, he was introduced to Christianity and decided to turn his life around. After his release, Colson rededicated his life to ministry and prison reform. Colson certainly believed he was at the top of his game during his White House years and admitted he got caught up in power. But listen to what he wrote in his book, When the Worst That Could Happen Already Has. The interesting thing is that what God used in my life is not my successes, academic awards, achievements, or triumphs. The fact that I argued before the Supreme Court, the fact that I was President Nixon's assistant, the fact that I was an administrative assistant in the Senate writing laws. He used none of those. He used the only significant thing in my life, that I was a prisoner who was broken and went through seven months in prison. Now I see the most significant thing about my life was my defeat. I really thank God for it. What matters is not what happens to you, but how you react to what happens to you. More important than what you do is what God does through you. And you'll never find that out except in those moments when you have no choice but to surrender yourself completely. We can, at times, be delusional about who we are, thinking way too highly of ourselves. But even Peter, Jesus' right-hand man, suffered from that. But it is amazing to think of what God can do with us when we realize that we owe it all to him. We don't have to be delusional. We can be devoted to what God asks of us. Be willing to be who God is asking you to be and make an even bigger difference than you thought you could on your own. Amen. And now, if you will please bow your heads with me for the pastoral prayer. Gracious and loving God, on the eve of your great sacrifice, you sat at the table with your disciples, sharing your life in the holy meal of bread and wine. We join our Christian brothers and sisters all over the world in your one uniting spirit, praying that our witness can remain effective, our spirits high, and our hearts steadfast. Draw us all together, Lord, brothers and sisters across the globe, so we can receive your forgiveness, your healing, your new life poured out for us. Then we can pass it on to others. Lord, make us instruments of peace, ministers of reconciliation, apostles of love. We know that you must have been conflicted yourself on this holy night. You were glad to have spent time spiritually with your friends, but you also knew the danger that was coming. We pray that we can show as much dignity and confidence as you did when we face trials. Now, Lord, prepare us for the recognition of your agony and pain. Help us not to put you on the cross in days to come, but to celebrate your victory by living lives that need no hiding under the cover of darkness. Be with us as we walk with you this final day to the cross. It is in your name that we pray. Amen. And on the back of your um, bulletin, if you are here in the, in the church, you have the liturgy for Holy Communion. I would invite you to take that at this time and be willing to follow it and respond when there are the options. I believe it will also be up on the screen. Let us join now in Holy Communion on Monday, Thursday. 
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the bread of life, breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets who looked for that day when justice would roll down like waters in righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. When nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And so, with your people on earth and all the company in heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. At his ascension, you exalted him to sit and reign with you at your right hand. And when the evening meal was completed, when he sat at the table with his friends, that one final time, Jesus took the bread. He lifted that up to heaven and th gave thanks to God for it. He broke it. He gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this as often as you can in remembrance of me. And when the evening meal was completed, Jesus took the cup. He lifted that up to heaven as well. He gave thanks to God for it. He poured it out. He gave it to each one of his friends, and he said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this as often as you can in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died, died. Christ, Christ is risen, risen. Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And together we said, Amen. For those who are here in the sanctuary, we hope that you have one of the communion packs. And for those who are joining us online at home, you possibly um, picked one of these up um, during the week. Um, and if so, we would invite you to take it at this time. We will be taking the, the bread first and eating it, and then we will be doing the, the grape juice. If you will take the very top plastic part and peel that back, revealing the bread, if you will please take the bread. When Jesus had his final meal with the disciples, they took unleavened bread, bread without yeast, which reminded them of the time in Egypt when they had to escape quickly 
and God made a way for them. Take this bread, eat it, and remember that God makes a way for you as well. And when the evening meal was over, he took the cup. He poured it out, whereas we will be peeling back the silver foil. And he said, in a strange way to the disciples that evening, because they didn't quite understand what it meant at the time, that this represented his blood that would come down on the cross just one day later. And every time they would take this, following that meal, they would remember that he said this, and that this represents his life essence being given for them. So take, drink, and recognize the sacrifice Jesus made for you. If you will then please bow your heads with me for the prayer. Our gracious God, we are thankful for this holy meal that you gave to us so many years ago. And on this Monday, Thursday, we remember it. We remember the love that you gave in this meal to your friends, and that extends to us today. Let us be able to be bolstered by the energy it gives us, both physically and spiritually. And let us be able to handle the journey to Good Friday and on to Easter. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And at this time, we will have our ending hymn before we have the extinguishing of the candles. Our closing hymn is Beneath the Cross of Jesus. It's number 297 in the hymnal. time I will invite Sean and Brennan to come forward with the acolyte sticks one last time 
And this is always one of the most poignant times of the Christian year for me. Um, because I am a visual person, and I know some of you are as well, and this is one way in which we can understand a little bit better what Jesus went through as he continued on his way to the cross. Um, in just a, a few seconds, we'll be turning out all the lights here in the sanctuary, and um, the, for those of you joining us at home, it will end in complete darkness um, uh, for, for the, the broadcast, so please, please know that that is what is supposed to happen. For those here in the sanctuary, um, after I close it, then we will be lifting some lights, and you will be um, invited to exit um, in silence. So there will be no postlude. We leave in silence as we contemplate what Jesus experienced. And so at this time, I will invite the Lights to be turned off, and we are ready to extinguish the disciple candles. After Jesus had been taken away from the disciples by the Roman guard, the disciples were as, at a loss as to what to do. It was as if they were frozen in fear. Their leader had just been arrested, and their thoughts of the Christ overcoming the world were shattered. What would happen next? They did not know, but each decided that following Jesus was no longer an option. Judas betrayed Jesus that night in the garden with a kiss. Bartholomew, who also called Nathaniel, had hesitated in the beginning to follow one who came from Nazareth now Bartholomew deserted Jesus. Jude, or Thaddeus as he was sometimes known, in later years, according to tradition, would become a preacher in Assyria and Persia. But now he too deserted Jesus. Thomas, the doubter, the one who sought proof left that night in the darkness. Matthew, who had been called in Capernaum, where he was a tax collector, joined the other disciples in leaving. James the Less, the younger James among the disciples, who, according to later tradition, was also crucified, on this night became fearful and departed. Philip, who came from Bethsaida on the Sea of Galilee, spent three years as a disciple, but fled on this fateful night. Simon, the zealot, who sought the violent overthrow of Roman rule, lost courage and left with the others. Andrew, a fisherman, first to be called to discipleship and the one who brought his brother Peter, feared what would happen and deserted Jesus. James had expressed a desire to sit beside Jesus when the kingdom would come, but he misunderstood what was required of him, so he too left in the darkness. Two disciples did go with Jesus. John, the disciple who sat next to Jesus during the meal, the one who was once asked if he could drink the cup that Jesus would drink, followed in the darkness until they took Jesus to the court of Caiaphas, the high priest. But outside the gate of the courtyard, John left also.
Peter went into the courtyard of Caiaphas. One woman asked Peter, are you not also one of this man's disciples? He said, I am not. Some of the slaves and officers were standing beside a charcoal fire to warm themselves. Peter was standing there with them when they asked if he was one of the disciples. Again, he denied it. Even when one of them remembered seeing him in the garden, he denied a third time knowing Jesus. The women also could be of no help at this time, leaving Jesus alone to face his tormentors. There is one candle left. In the darkness of the night, all his followers deserted Jesus. When morning came, Jesus would be taken before Pilate, flogged, beaten, mocked, and led out to be crucified. The lone light reminds us that Jesus goes alone to suffer and to die. Thankfully, though, that is not the end of the story. Amen.